database, have it scanned, have it searchable, so that people can go back and reference things so we aren't reinventing the wheel. Not too long ago on the blogs, there was a blog posted, The Next Century of Mormon Studies. And point number one, the first task is we need to take stock of what has been done. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, Royals talked just a few minutes ago. There's a lot of stuff floating around out there that's wrong. And part of what we can do by taking stock of what's been done in the past is be sure that errors are not perpetuated. Once we're sure that something that even Hugh Nibley said has now been um, rendered obsolete by new, uh, new discoveries, we need to be able to have a way in which to communicate to everyone that that doesn't hold water anymore. But for the things that have stood the test of time, we need to be able to know uh, where we are on those things. Publishers, I would say, and I would include BYU studies, we typically do this, but I'm not sure everyone does, should not accept anything for publication in the Book of Mormon area unless it is clear that the author has done his home or her homework and has looked at all of the relevant materials in the past that deals with that subject to bring the matter current and up to date. We have to begin with ourselves and discipline uh, what we are doing so that we aren't just uh, in the echo chamber, as has been said. So, Kirk, with that, I think uh, we can look at a lot of things, many of which are essential reading, and some of which need uh, a little bit of updating. Some of, this, some of this stuff is clearly obsolete at this point in time. But here's a run through of uh, what we've uh, experienced together in our lifetimes. We begin with 1951. Have President David McKay was recently the prophet. We had um, uh, Milton R. Hunter for six years had been on, on in the uh, general among the general authorities with a specific instruction: do work on the Book of Mormon. Had come uh, straight from uh, the brethren. We had uh, John A. Widsell, who was still with us, would be for another two or three years. He'd been instrumental in founding or helping found the uh, Department of Archaeology here at BYU. And John Sorensen was a undergraduate. And he was the editor of the very first uh, Uni uh, University Archaeological Society newsletter. And when Hugh Nibley returned from World War II, he took a, a job temporarily in the church historical department working under John Widsell. And it was Widsell who encouraged Nibley to write a series that appeared, first of all, in the Improvement Era starting in 1947, and it eventually came out as Lehi in the Desert. Which we'll get to in 1952. <laughs> Right here, this had been serialized previously in church publications, and now we have the first real modern uh, Book of Mormon book. And this book was really quite amazing because more than anything else, and maybe you all remember it, I remember reading this book on a camping trip in the High Sierras when I was uh, just in high school. My mother carried it all the way up, and I figured, well, if she's going to carry it, I better read it. But uh, it showed us that you could think about the Book of Mormon in ways that people never had before. This was really a completely new mindset, just thinking about the Book of Mormon in a fully ancient cultural setting. He taught us that the Book of Mormon can be read as an ancient book. 1953, we have the New World Archaeological Foundation begins its first se season of field work. Where do they go? They find a large north flowing river. In this case, it was the Grijalva. Part of that was an anti-Jakeman uh, reaction on the part of, of uh, Sorensen and, and Lowe. But they went to uh, Wimangillo in uh, the state of Tabasco, Mexico, and were looking for Zarahemla, basically. They found nothing. <clears throat> what happened then was that uh, John and Thomas Stewart Ferguson, who was the financier of this uh, project at that point in time, hopped in a jeep, went to the upper Grijalva, and they found an embarrassment of riches of pre-classic material, and John Sorensen has been there ever since. 1953. Uh, 53. 53. Uh, what is that? Read. Franklin S. Harris. Oh, yes. Book of Mormon, Message and Evidences. This is a man who served in the mission field in England under um, Johnny Whitsell. And Elder Widso asked him specifically, would you go to the British Museum and look up, a uh, find a bunch of stuff that supports the Book of Mormon? Kind of sounds like uh, Orville Gunther and uh, uh, Jack Welch in uh, Germany, doesn't it? <laughs> Not quite. But. Yeah. Anyway, this is the son of the, the person for whom the Harris Fine Arts Center is named at BYU campus. His dad was the president of BYU. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, 
uh, Hugh Nibley was on the radio, KSL, for a whole year doing Time Vindicates the Prophets. Notice the title there, Time Vindicates the Prophets. This was clearly an effort to go back into early Christian literature. Nibley was very, very good at uh, the patristics, Greek and Latin early Christian fathers, and finding places where early Christianity was in harmony with modern Mormon doctrine and improving on the problems that Christianity had fallen into theologically. This is then published called, in a book called The World and the Prophets. The vindication is lost, maybe the apologetic edge a little bit diminished there. But what that book showed us was that it's not just Arabic or Hebrew, but also Greek and Latin and all of the ancient world, and not just for archaeological purposes, but theological reasons as well. 1955, we have the LDS Church formerly, or formally sponsoring with large sums of money excavation in the center of the parish of Chappas. NWF really begins his work. And Nibley again, uh, there were Jaredites. Uh, this was published serially in the Improvement Era. I remember reading these uh, with Nibley's picture in uh, the home I was growing up in back in the, gee, I was 10 years old when those were coming out. But uh, what Nibley does here is he shows that over and over again what people had for centuries thought about uh, Babylonian history, Hittite history. They didn't even know about the Hittites for a long time. The Hittite laws were discovered in 1951. And Nibley's right up to date knowing that these old models of how these uh, ancient civilizations lived and worked were wrong and that uh, we need to go back and rethink a lot of the things that we've previously thought, including relating to the Book of Mormon. 1957, the Melchizedek Priesthood Quorums studied Hugh Nibley. How many of you remember using this orange <laughs> priesthood manual? Uh, when this was presented to Joseph Fielding Smith, they said, and David O. McKay, and Pre President McKay, they said, many of the brethren will have to reach. He said, particularly the high priests in Parowan. <laughs> it will be over their heads. And President, President McKay said, let them reach. Uh, 1958, we have Jakeman, who's going into a place called Agua Catal in uh, Campeche in Mexico. And he thinks this is where the Tulan, you've heard that name mentioned many times today by Elder Mask and others. But that's where Jakeman, from his uh, State of the Chronicles, thought that Toulon probably was. And that was his bountiful. Uh, 1959, we've got uh, Gareth W. Lowe, who ended up uh, being a prolific uh, researcher and writer for NWF. And this was the Chiapas Project, 55 to 58. This was the very first major publication that came out in, in 59, describing uh, where the NWF, NWF had spent the church's money digging in those areas that uh, uh, Jack and, and uh, Tom Ferguson had identified. 1960, uh, we have uh, Sidney B. Sperry, who publicly comes out and says, you know what, I think there really were two Camorras. <laughs> this was kind of a major deal for uh, someone uh, in the BYU Religion Department to actually come out and espouse this theory. Well, and uh, not just someone, wasn't he the dean at that time? I believe he was the dean of, of uh, religious education. So for me to find out today that we have now two Mesoamericanists on the, LD, on the uh, religious faculty at BYU, we've come a long way. Let's see, where are we? There's 59. One more. There we go. Um, well, 1961, there was this frenzy about Stilo uh, 5, and it reached even the instructor. So official church publications were actually out there beating the drum uh, for Stilo 5. 62, we got uh, continuing work in Chappas with NWAF. 63, Ross Christensen publishes this progress in archaeology which was an anthology of the first 85 issues of the, of the old UAS newsletter that we show you there at first, beginning in 1951. Some interesting stuff. Some of this stuff is, is, is still valid today. 1964, we have uh, the very first hint that there might be some uh, Semitic linguistics happening. This was Pierre Grenet, memorandum on the Sawizal linguistics, and Robert Smith, who's in the audience with us today, bless him, has done some of the most uh, amazing work on Book of Mormon Studies. But he came out with three publications in the several years based on uh, this hint. Of course, uh, in, in later years, it's been a, a lot of it has, has uh, fallen uh, to Brian Stubbs and the U.S. Taken uh, connection. That's kind of overwhelmed things. 
But there for a while, we thought Zapotec might be the most likely uh, language of the Nephites because of this work. Okay, we get to 65, and uh, this is where Santa Rosa gets published, and this is John Sorensen's uh, Zarahemla. Was back uh, in 55 when he first put his correlation together, was in, in 85 when he, when he published uh, Ancient America, uh, Setting for the Book of Mormon, and it's still there in, in uh, 2003 with his Mormon's Codex. There's, there's the research upon which that is based. Now, 65 is also when something got published that Jack Welch uh, noticed in Germany. This is uh, Paul Gechter's book, Die Literarische Kunst im Matthäus Evangelium, The Literary Art in the Gospel of Matthew. It had been published by the Stuttgarter Bibelstudien in 1965. Stuttgart was in my mission. And I was in Regensburg when I went to a lecture given by a Catholic uh, Jesuit uh, on the New Testament. And he referred to this and Gechter's argument that Matthew was particularly uh, Hebraic because of his use uh, of chiastic structures. Uh, that was the uh, first time I had heard of that subject. I went to uh, uh, the bookstore nearby and bought the book, Gector's book, and it was in this copy of the Book of Mormon that I then, through a stroke of uh, a bolt from the blue, as we've said today, uh, found Mosiah chapter 5, verses 1 to verses 10 to 12 is the first chiasm that was found in that. But I want you to notice the cover of this book. This is the dust jacket on the Book of Mormon that we were handing out as missionaries in the South German mission. It has Izapa Stila 5 on the cover. Perhaps subliminally that was getting my mind ready to see <laughs> ancient structures there. <laughs> well, you talk to Garth, they'll tell you it is this chiastic structure know, right in that book. right there. <laughs> Uh, all right, 66 is when Garth Norman first uh, came out with uh, his uh, published version of the Reconstruction of Correlation Geography of the Land Southward. I mention that because uh, his theories on how this whole thing fits together geographically are proving true with uh, the latest research. 67, August 19th. Uh, Jack is a missionary. 18th, okay. 18th of August in, in, in 1967. Chiasmus Day. Uh, uh, Jack is in Regensburg, Germany, and he gets up early in the morning. Well, I was awakened uh, at, it was still dark, and awakened by a very clear sounding message. If it is evidence of Hebrew style in the Bible, it must be evidence of Hebrew style in the Book of Mormon. And as I've often said, the real miracle of that morning was I got out of bed <laughs> and stumbled over to the table where we had been studying the night before and sat down and, and thought, all right, if it's here, where? And I felt, just open and read where you were reading last night with your companion. We'd been reading in Mosiah chapter 3, uh, King Benjamin's speech, turning a couple pages and reading, and there was a typesetting where two long German words were stacked right on top of each other. They, one should have been translated as a verb and the other as a noun from the English, but both had been translated as long German nouns. And it was that duplication that was the center of the first chiasm that I found. Uh, 67 was also the year that Hugh Nibley came out with since Camorra. He was updating things all the time. Master at going through and saying, you know what, in the last five years things have changed. And and the importance of this book was that Since Camorra also has half of it called Since Qumran. This is where Nibley was getting into a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls material and telling us over and over again that this is the peculiar blessing of this generation. And it's not just in Hebraic or Coptic or wherever, but Mesoamerican, a whole out, outpouring of new documents, new information, things that came forth that people even 50, 60 years ago had no idea about. And so Nibley was, like you say, right up on, uh, right up to speed, reading a lot of these uh, Dead Sea Scrolls materials in German, where they had been published first in translation. We also had Sidney B. Sperry, 68, that came out with a book that uh, stayed in print for a long time, his Book of Mormon uh, Compendium. Yeah, and I'd like to correct one thing here in Sperry's uh, Book of Mormon Compendium. In reading King Benjamin's speech, he says, we could think about Benjamin as a very simple farmer. Uh, a hard worker with his hands, because, you know, he does say, I, I haven't uh, made you work or pay hard taxes uh, for me. But he goes on to say, probably not very well educated, 
not a good writer. I think, wow. Missed ah. the boat on that one, as we'll say <laughs> in a few more minutes. Oh, we'll, we'll show you the book Jack wrote on King Benjamin's speech here in a minute. <laughs> All right, uh, 69, when Jack's article on chiasmus appeared in BYU Studies. This rocked our world. And uh, I published this, uh, I submitted it to BYU Studies only uh, a couple months after I returned from my mission. And there's a long story about exactly how that came about. Let me just say I now know who the referee was that accepted this for <laughs> publication. George Tate was the editor. I'm not George, Chuck Tate was the editor. Truman Madsen was the reviewer oh, who let this one through. Uh, and uh, that's coming from the, the man who's been the editor of BYU Studies now for about 20 years? Yeah, a little, little over 20 years. Uh, okay, 1970. Uh, this is when Joe Allen published uh, uh, his uh, doctoral dissertation on uh, Quetzalcoatl. This is the classic interpretation of the, the, the white and bearded god. Brant Gardner would not agree with this particular interpretation. Nonetheless, uh, that was an important milestone, 1970. 71. Uh, Cyrus Gordon came out with Before Columbus, which uh, of course uh, started the whole di uh, diffusionist uh, um, issue, kind of, kind of revved up the engines on that, uh, sort of there'd been a seething debate. We then have in 1972, a most unlikely venue for Jack Welch's chiasmus, it was the New Era. How many of you remember reading the February 1972 article, Chiasmus in the Book of Mormon, with the subtitle, the Book of Mormon does it again. <laughs> I run into people all the time who tell me that they read that sometime in the 70s and it changed their life. Well, uh, this changed my life because Brian Kelly was the editor of the New Era. He was the Elders Corps instructor in my American 414th Ward, 1972, the year I left on my mission. Well, and I thank Jay Todd for seeing this. He saw the article in BYU Studies, wanted it in the New Era because that's what he was the editor of. Yeah. And, uh, he, he was over in England for uh, the first area conference where lots of the brethren came over to Manchester. And that's where he and I got talking about this. And it was thrown together a little rough. There are some statements in there that can be misunderstood as exaggerations. But hey. Uh, <laughs> you were only one. I was, I, was, I, was, I was young and I was writing to kids. Early 20s. And, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But can you imagine the new era today publishing this kind of uh, heavy duty material? Um, Okay, 1973, Garth Norman's Izapa uh, album comes out. Major milestone in the interpretation of those monuments. 73, a most interesting thing happened. <clears throat> the images of a, of a, a postage stamp from 1973. The reason being this was a forum <clears throat> that was put together by mail, because email didn't exist back then. All the electronic sort of things we do nowadays uh, weren't there. So uh, basically Dave Palmer, because John Sorensen had just moved back from Santa Barbara up to BYU and accepted a faculty position at BYU, he took advantage of that and he put together a, a forum and it included Garth uh, uh, Norman, who's here today. It included Bob Smith, who's here today. And it also included uh, Bruce Warren, who's deceased, Thomas Stewart Ferguson, and uh, they were basically discussing Book of Mormon geography. Yeah, and wouldn't you say, Kirk, that this had a lot to do with the mentality that led to farms? We have groups of people who are trying to communicate with each other. There's no internet, there are no email. And at the same time this was going on, lots of us who had studied under Nibley were off doing graduate work, and we were also communicating in this way. Farms would come along in a few years to bring these people together in more uh, regular correspondence. 1974 uh, was a man that I've, I'll always hold in great respect, Jen and I Washburn. He was probably as advanced of a theorist on Book of Mormon uh, uh, ge geography as we've had in the church up to this point. And he was a high school teacher in American Fork, but he published his Lands and Times of the Book of Mormon that was his magnum opus. <clears throat> uh, an excellent, uh, for the time, internal reconstruction of the text. We then have 1975 when uh, President uh, Benson gives his, his first of what became a series of very bold addresses on the importance of the Book of Mormon and stating over and over again that we were under a condemnation because we had not given enough attention to the Book of Mormon, particularly to do what the Book of Mormon says, but also to flood the world with the uh, truths of the Book of Mormon. Now, when farms really got started in 1980-81, uh, we took uh, these, some of these uh, uh, statements from the prophet, or who was soon to be the prophet, uh, President Benson, to heart. Okay, 76, we have a very significant uh, article that's published in the SHA newsletter 
is John Sorensen's The Book of Mormon as a Mesoamerican Codex. This was his first iteration of the data which many of you have purchased today in his uh, most recent work, Mormon's Codex. 1976, we also had Garth uh, published his uh, Izapa text. And we had Lynn Hope Hilton that began a very exciting journey of, of retracing Lehi steps uh, down the Arabian Peninsula along the Red Sea. We also had Barry Fail, who came out with America BC. Now, I've got to tell you a funny story. <laughs> <clears throat> I went to visit Barry Fail at his home in Boston. And I, he, he knew I was from BYU, so I said, I want to show you this. He took me to a cabinet. It had about 50 copies of the Book of Mormon. He said, oh, you Mormons have been so gracious. You've sent me all these copies of the book. And uh, he said, so many of them have little signatures in the front where you're bearing your testimony to me and uh, telling me that I really had to read this book. And he said, I, I, I will tell you this. I find the book useful. He said, whenever the Jehovah's Witnesses come along and knock on my door, I hand one of these books, and they uh, promptly go away. <laughs> In 1977, we begin to have the computer enter into BYU studies. We've got uh, this exhaustive uh, uh, concordance. This was basically the next edition of what uh, had been published clear back in, in the 1890s uh, with uh, uh, George Reynolds when he did it all by hand as he was an inmate in the Utah State Penitentiary. Now we have computers doing it in 1970. All right, this is an important book. Uh, this is cited significantly in John Sorensen's uh, current uh, uh, Mormon Codex. Mesoamerican communication routes. I recommend this to anybody that really wants to understand what's going on <clears throat> in ancient Mesoamerica. All right, 1978, we have word print comes into to play. First effort at it. Uh, this has been a continuing theme in Book of Mormon studies. And I do want to point out that Tim Layton, who did appear in the BYU studies version of this, mm -hmm. was not on the original one. And he was majorly ticked because he was the undergrad. I wasn't the editor then. No, no, no. Well, but still, your, your publication got it right, because they included him. Oh. He was majorly ticked because he was only the undergrad who did uh, most of the work. Uh, but Al, uh, uh, Larson Wrencher got all the credit. <clears throat> you don't want to mess with Tim Layton, because he now runs Source and Capital. <clears throat> okay. All right, 1979. This is when Jack Welch and two of uh, his uh, uh, commuting partners, his, one, one of whom was his brother-in-law, actually legally incorporated farms in Los Angeles. We were practicing law in Los Angeles, and I needed two other people to sign the Articles of Incorporation, and, uh, and they were willing. And uh, we said, but what are we going to call it? And I said, well, maybe a Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, Farms. That would be a real funny name. And we tried to come up with another name, and we couldn't. We just kept calling it Farms, and, well, it stuck. And finally, we decided it doesn't matter. Madison Avenue tells you it really doesn't matter what they call you as long as they remember your name. When farms moved to Provo the next year, 1980, that was our original logo. That was what it looked like in the very early days. And the race was for research. Now, there's some, a, a very important meeting happened in 1979 where Jack Welch and John Sorensen met for the first time. It happened at Delbert Palmer's house in Provo. Garth was there that night. <clears throat> I picked you up at the, at the motel there in, in uh, Provo and took you over that meeting. When these two geniuses, two of the paragons of Book of Mormon uh, studies in our era, first met for the, for the first time, modern Book of Mormon studies You're talking really about came Palmer together. and Sorensen? No, oh, no. <laughs> in fact, don't you remember that uh, uh, Sorensen looked at you and said, you're the missing link. And you said, what does that make me, some kind of Neanderthal? <laughs> <laughs> the missing link meaning that uh, Sorensen recognized in, in uh, Jack all the qualities that uh, uh, Sorensen and I had not been able to manage to, to come to put together ourselves, just the two of us. Well, and we had never met before, but in the 1976 uh, Codex article, John had uh, cited the BYU Studies article on chiasmus, and we had a wonderful time meeting each other there for the first time. Okay, 1980, uh, we have the first time that people of normal means can actually publish a replica of the first edition. I ran right out and got that in my library, because I knew I would never be able to afford a, a real first edition, but this was pretty close. Now the newsletter. Maybe Let's see. You skip this page. Oh, okay, we'll pass it. All right, uh, 1980, the very first edition of the Farms Newsletter came out. Yeah, and I understand from the Maxwell Institute people that they are now scanning all of these, and the uh, full run of all of the farms newsletters will be on the web before very long. We call that Insights in Ancient Window, and it's, it's uh, still being published just in some form today. Okay, 81, major, major milestone in the, in the history of the Book of Mormon, in, in the LDS uh, uh, tradition, the 1981 edition. 
This was the, the uh, committee that was chaired uh, by uh, Bruce R. McConkie. <clears throat> 81, the results of that uh, geography forum that we talked about uh, back in 73 now come to, uh, to print. This is Del uh, uh, D David Palmer's In Search of Camorra. Much of John Sorensen's material was, was in here. In fact, this was a major impetus to John to, to go ahead and get his um, uh, New World setting of the Book of Mormon published in, uh, four years later in 85 because he, he, he saw uh, uh, Dave coming out with this. But this is a pretty good book. 1981, we had a very interesting meeting at BYU. <clears throat> it was in the administration building. And we got together a whole bunch of folks, maybe 15, 20 people, and we set out uh, an agenda for what we wanted to accomplish in the next uh, 10, uh, 15, 20 years. These are some of the things that we said. Goals, organize the existing material, just like you said at the beginning of this talk. See what's already been done. Engage existing LDS scholars. We wanted to get people uh, talking to each other. As many as we could involve. Preserve Nibley's reputation so he'll continue to influence future generations. Yeah, and this was 1981. Nibley had just uh, recovered a few years earlier from a heart attack, and we didn't know how long he was going to be with us. But the antis were absolutely intent on trying to destroy his reputation. Yeah, and many of them saying that when you check his footnotes, they don't check out. Well, we checked out all those footnotes, and yes, there were a few typos, but none of the problems that they were complaining about. Most of us had realized that our testimonies and our faithfulness in the LDS Church owed something to the genius of Hugh Nibley. And we wanted to make sure that that uh, continued on for future generations. We also wanted to, to uh, publish material for both laymen and specialists, and we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could publish an encyclopedia like the Encyclopedia Judaica or the, uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia? Yep. And that meant that Millen would probably be the publisher. And then we said, but before we can do an encyclopedia, we need to have a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. I mean, we were thinking 50 years down the road. Yeah. And we're on that path, but we all pull together, and the more we can get together, the more that becomes a possibility, maybe even in our lifetimes. This was the first time, in my, to my knowledge, that the Book of Mormon appeared in scholarly literature in an appropriate context alongside other ancient literatures. Chiasmus in Ugaritic, Chiasmus in Sumero Akkadian, Chiasmus in, in, in the ancient Greek, Chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. I was just overjoyed. And thanks, Jack. This, this was his uh, project. Well, and Bob Smith's, too. Well, Bob Smith was involved in almost everything. Bob Smith doesn't get nearly enough credit for some of the things that he's done over the years. We'll, we'll get to him in a minute. 1982, Noel Reynolds, Book of Mormon Authorship. This was published by the Religious Studies Center. Noel later on went on to become the president of Farms. He currently, he's currently the president of Mount Timonogos Temple. But a tremendous piece uh, for, for its uh, time period. Set uh, new, a, a new bar, basically, for Book of Mormon Studies. Okay, 83, one of the first projects we put together at Farms. We called it the Lands of the Book of Mormon. This was a little click, click slideshow. 1984, we took a tour. Uh, this was put together by Joe Allen. And the, the two um, uh, commentators on that tour, Jack Welch and John Sorensen. There may never be another Book of Mormon tour quite like it. It was pretty <laughs> phenomenal. We, we were just checking out all of John's uh, descriptions of these places. So we went to places that normally weren't uh, visited. Joe Allen was wonderful taking us all of these places. What a time that was. 1984. First edition of the critical text of the Book of Mormon. Royal Skousen has done marvelous work, but he wasn't the first. Bob Smith was the first. And this was the first critical text that came out. 84, it was updated uh, then uh, in uh, uh, two more editions, the final, final one in 87. And this particular critical text has some really neat stuff in it. For instance, I can go in here and I can see every single speaker who is speaking, who, who's, who's the author of this particular text. I can see um, John Hilton had identified a lot of those. I can see the, the, the chronology. Uh, one of the things that Bob's been so terrific with is, is this whole notion of, of uh, what was happening in Old World chronology. And he, he has the Maya chronology in here. Uh, where are we at in the, in the Maya long count at this particular point? And the, this was a pretty uh, impressive piece of work. It really was. And what, what Bob does in the, this critical text is more like what is done with uh, critical texts of the Old Testament or the New Testament looking a lot at intertextual relationships, source criticism, as well as the different variations between what we knew at that point of the uh, printer's manuscript and the 1830 edition and so on. Royal's objective is to try to get back to what he thinks was spoken by 
uh, by Joseph Smith. That's as far back as, as we can get with the earliest text with, uh, as far as Royal is concerned. But uh, Bob's sweep was much wider. There's plenty of room for both of these kinds of critical texts. Well, and I understand uh, Bob told me a few days ago that, that he might be working on uh, a new edition he of, is. Of, of that critical text, which would be marvelous because it's a tremendous resource. Okay, 85, milestone in the history of Book of Mormon studies. John Sorensen, Ancient American Setting for the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> the world would never be the same again. However, in 85, one of the finest videos that LDS Church has ever produced, actually it was BYU that put this out, is still a favorite of mine. I have several copies. I give it away all the time. I'm now currently serving as a bishop, and I, I give this video to some of the members of my war. I say, read this and come back and tell me about it, and then we'll talk about your problems. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, the Faith of an Observer, a, a biographical sketch of Hugh Nibley. Now, the collected works of Hugh Nibley began to be published in 1986. They were not finished until 2010. But we so, got 10 of them out in the first five years. This was perhaps the largest concentrated publishing effort in Mormondom up to this point. It'll probably be exceeded by such things as the Joseph Smith Papers Project, that, that type of thing, but it's clearly on a scale of, of, of that magnitude. This was an enormous project. 1987. We have a female who makes a significant contribution. Hooray for the women here. This was Susan Easton Black, and she found, uh, based on some, other, some earlier stuff that uh, uh, Jack and some other people had done, she went through and analyzed every example of Christology in the Book of Mormon. And she found that the Book of Mormon text is more Christological than the New Testament, which blew us away. Okay, 88, Rick Hout publishes his deciphering of the text of the Book of Mormon. I don't know if Rick's, uh, there he is, Rick's still in the room. Well, I want, I want him to hear this. Rick, when your book was published, it was universally panned. All the critics basically said, this is baloney. The reason being that it was only three years after John Sorensen's magnum opus, and we were also enthralled with John Sorensen. We all had John Sorensen on the brain. Rick was taking some, some very iconoclastic and some very different sorts of, of approaches in this uh, deciphering the book. I'm here to tell you, Pay attention to some of the things he says in here. Tonalah, Chiapas is very important. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Book of Mormon in that little municipio of Tonalah, Chiapas, as Rick uh, uh, points out in this book. And, and, and some of the latest research is, is uh, highlighting that. 88, we have uh, the Book of Mormon published uh, in, in a, the complete book published according to Hebrew poetry. Well, and what we have here is not just chiasms, but all different forms of parallelism. And the text set out so that you actually encounter these uh, different forms of synthetic or antithetical parallelisms or other kinds of uh, Hebraic forms as you read through the text. So it's uh, a kind of an early version of a reader's edition of the Book of Mormon, but from literary critical points of view, looking at form, form criticism. This is uh, 88 when Brian Stubbs comes out with his Elements of Hebrew and Euro-Aztecan. And uh, he's been published on this ever since. This has been kind of a sub-theme to his professional uh, career, which has been basically he's one of the world's uh, leading specialists on the Udo-Aztec language family. But there's enough Hebrew stuff going on in there that uh, he comes out every once in a while with some zingers. Okay, 89. Uh, our keynote speaker today, Dan Peterson, was the first editor of the Farms Review of Books. And that began, to, that's basically where FAIR came from, right there, was that effort. This was our, our apologetic uh, engine for, for a number of years in the church. Now, Chris is no longer here. He had to go home early to, to spend time with his wife. <clears throat> but uh, he was here earlier today. He became the Book of Mormon novelist. And he now has over 20 novels out there based on Book of Mormon themes. And what a contribution he's made, especially to some of the young people in the church who, 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 with whom his novels are quite popular. OK, 1990, John Sorensen. You know, you know at that time, we, we also were having the Living Scriptures cartoons. Oh, that's right. And uh, so there's a generation of us who benefited those raising our children. Yeah, that's, that's true. And in fact, it was uh, Paul Chessman who was originally uh, a bankroll of that particular project with Living Scriptures. Anyway, um, John Sorensen came out with his geography source book in uh, 1990. And then we had this important piece, uh, Bill Hamlin and Stephen Ricks, Warfare in the Book of Mormon. Now, this was the first of a series of symposia that we, uh, we put together, taking a topic in the Book of Mormon and inviting 20, 30 people to send in papers, and then we would have a, a whole day conference. If you don't have a deadline, Mormon scholars don't tend to get anything done. <laughs> so we, uh, we set deadlines, but we, we had working groups, we shared information, we critiqued each other's papers, and presented them, and then out came 
this volume, it was a, a good model for how to get uh, people focused and working on a, a concentrated topic. And that's still being done in uh, uh, things like the Salt Press uh, groups that are getting together. It's a good model, and I think uh, it was very successful. This is the first where that was attempted. But uh, there's some very significant things in here. I, I still read this with, with uh, terrific interest today because it, it, it informs on my research. Okay, uh, John Sorensen, Martin Reich, did some amazing work. This was just plain a labor of love because th this has not been particularly lauded in the professional uh, community. But they put together a, a terrific compilation of evidences, a bibliography, and a, and a bibliography of contact across the seas. Now this is an example of terrific Book of Mormon scholarship, okay? This is uh, Jack here, who's done uh, behind this. First of all, in 1990, <clears throat> we have the Sermon at the Temple and the Sermon on the Mount. This was a first attempt to, to uh, read, uh, uh, to do close reading and, and come up with uh, some uh, real background behind King Benjamin's speech. No, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Or I'm sorry, the, the uh, Savior's Third Nephi uh, speech. Right, and you know, one of the things that we need to spend more time working on, and Alan mentioned this in his, in his presentation, is looking at all of the places where we have biblical, especially New Testament material in the Book of Mormon. And the Sermon on the Mount, what's it doing in the Book of Mormon has been a problem because most people think in biblical circles that the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew was written by Matthew. It's kind of a collection of a stamp book of sayings of Jesus because it doesn't seem to have any coherent theme holding it together. And in 1988, I was wrestling with that question. And kind of like uh, uh, Garth was saying, I read a text that I'd read many times before where it says that Jesus came, the people were gathered at the temple. It doesn't say in the temple, but at the temple. They're in a sacred space. And all of a sudden I got wondering, is this somehow a sacred text? And of course, Moses goes up into the mountain, a sacred mountain, to receive the law and the word of the Lord. And maybe that's got some connection with what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount. And therefore, it's perfectly appropriate to have it there. Well, putting that little piece together then led to the, uh, uh, the publication, first of an update, but then of the uh, Deseret Book version. In 1998, uh, I put out a second edition, which has a long chapter in it on ritual critical studies. I'd spent time with the uh, American Academy of Religion people trying to work with them on how do you tell whether there is a ritual standing behind some kind of a text. And wanting to see if the Sermon on the Mount couldn't be understood as having some kind of ritual context behind it. And that book drew some attention of uh, New Testament scholars, and the Sermon on the Mount in the Light of the Temple, published in 2009, uh, was uh, an invited publication. Ashgate published it. There's very little Book of Mormon material in that, but what that book tries to do is to take the idea of seeing the Sermon on the Mount as a ritual text and showing that to be the case exclusively out of biblical resources looking just at the Greek and the passages in Matthew and in the Psalms and where all of the, uh, the rhetorical voice and register of the Sermon on the Mount is coming from. So that's attracted some attention outside of Mormon circles, but it all began with an understanding uh, that wouldn't have been here without the Book of Mormon. It's an excellent example of good Book of Mormon scholarship that then is able to transform uh, or to translate well into biblical scholarship. <clears throat> Okay, 1981, we have John Sorensen, Melvin Thorne editing, Rediscovering the Book of Mormon. This is kind of reflective. This is going back and, and uh, compiling some of the best stuff that have been published by Farms after that point. We then have Jack Welch, 1992, a similar uh, uh, sort of a topic, re-exploring the Book of Mormon. Uh, these are just the updates. Every month we published a, an update of some new thing that had been found. These are the updates of the 1980s. We then have in uh, 1992, the journal, journal Book of Mormon Studies first appears. Stephen Ricks was the first editor. And we uh, heard in Mark Wright's uh, uh, presentation day that uh, that's now uh, continuing. Back to the name. And uh, back, uh, renamed back now Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. 
1992. Encyclopedia of Mormonism was published by Macmillan. And of course, there are a lot of uh, articles in here, almost 100, dealing with the Book of Mormon. And uh, I think this was the first time that you could have a real uh, wide range of topics on everything from the doctrines and teachings of the Book of Mormon to the economy and warfare. And we pulled all of the things together that we had at our access at that point. And uh, uh, this is still available online, electronically. You can uh, uh, access this at eom.byu.edu. I wanted to get some to Gordon Thomas in here, Jack. Great guy. I'll never forget uh, the day in the, the law school library when Gordon comes in, uh, Bob was there with him, and they say, we have Hebrew festivals in the Book of Mormon. We found it. The Feast of Tabernacles is here. Mm -hmm. Electricity went through the room. Yeah. Hasn't that been a fun uh, part of this, uh, this whole career? Yeah, those, little, those little aha moments. Uh, this happens to be uh, uh, Gordon's uh, publication on uh, the, the uh, uh, symbols that associated kingship in the Nephite uh, realm. 1994, um, we get uh, the allegory of the olive tree in Jacob chapter 5, analyzed. And this draws a lot on uh, olive culture and looking at things that are pertinent to understanding passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where olive imagery is used but developed and much more uh, well, just brilliantly used in Jacob chapter 5. So this is an overlap between ancient Near Eastern agriculture, archaeobotany, and the Book of Mormon. There had been such a tremendous frenzy around the Mormon church, literally a feeding frenzy on this whole notion of chiasmus, that we began to have chiasmus shown up, as Jack says, in the phone book. <laughs> well. So in 1995, we have, he comes out with this criteria for evaluating, identifying, and uh, basically uh, judging the, the significance of chiasmus. Yeah, and this is still a standard, and it gets cited quite widely because it's uh, readily uh, available on the web. Uh, but as Kirk says, I even got invited once. I got a flyer inviting me to a chiasmus dance where a group of young adults back in Virginia had some dance planned where you had to dance with five people in one order, and then you had to dance with the same five in the opposite order. I knew the chiasmus studies had really arrived at that yeah. point. Well, when I was a freshman at BYU in 71, uh, there was a big uh, poster for a, uh, some sort of a, an event that was going to be held there in, in the uh, Wilk. And it said, Chiasmus, the mind of God. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to, to uh, that, that whole concept really take it over. All right, uh, 96. This is another labor of love. There are just a handful of, of situations in the uh, uh, history of Book of Mormon studies where people have just put their heart and soul into this thing with thousands and thousands of hours of work. And this is one of them, a comprehensive bibliography. This was uh, uh, Don Perry, Jeanette Miller, Sandra Thorne. Oh, bless people who are willing to go to that Well, kind of and for, for gathering what has been done in the past, starting there gives us everything that was done up to 1995. That was a pretty, a pretty thorough examination of a Book of Mormon studies up through, up through that uh, time period. OK, uh, this is Noel Reynolds' 1997 uh, piece. And this is a substantial piece of scholarship. This was published this time by Farms. Noel Reynolds at that time, was he the president of Farms in 97? I think he was. Anyway, marvelous. It doesn't get much better than this. Uh, 97 also is when uh, John Sorens came out with his, his big coffee table picture book, basically. And I wish it. that would be reprinted. It, this is a good piece. It's fabulous. I've learned a lot uh, from there. 97 was also the year when FAIR uh, uh, began. And that was started in New York. And Scott Gordon uh, uh, started that. It's going strong today. Excellent organization. Do a lot of good for the church. 97, we also have uh, Don Perry and Jack Welch uh, editing the, uh, Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. And this was another one of those collaborative groups with uh, probably, what, a dozen, maybe 15 authors. Okay, this is the one I was alluding to earlier. This is your King Benjamin speech book. You just gave me a copy of this about six uh, months ago. I appreciate that greatly. Well, it's... Uh, this was one of the most exciting things I'd ever worked on. Of course, I had seen chiasmus in King Benjamin's speech, but also coronation ceremonies, King Benjamin's use of the law of the, uh, uh, of the king in Deuteronomy 17, and we started wondering, let's do a really thorough analysis of, of these four chapters. Well, we ended up with 660 pages 
on the, those just those four chapters. I think King Benjamin's speech is one of the masterpieces of world literature ever written anywhere. And mm -hmm. we set out to try to show that in this book. And boy, it, it, it really, I think, lived up to what we'd hoped it would yeah, be. And, and I, I've uh, been in correspondence with some of the folks at the EU who are teaching Book of Mormon's literature right now. This is one of the fundamental texts they are using. Good. Okay, uh, 99, pressing forward with the Book of Mormon. Just the updates of the 90s. 99, we've got uh, the, the, the uh, darling of gospel doctrine teachers everywhere. <laughs> Years ago when I was a gospel doctrine teacher, I loved this particular book because it, yeah. it made just such interesting material. Uh, to just hand out before class and get people talking about the book. Now this was done in the days when we still had overhead projectors and my son had his mission call and had nothing to do the whole summer as he was waiting to go into the MTC going to Sweden. And he wanted to go play golf all summer. He wanted also, and he has en ended up going into graphic arts as a, in an ad agency. But uh, as a uh, preparation for his mission, I said, Greg, what I want you to do for me, every day I want you to produce a chart. Here's the data, make a chart. <laughs> and out of that came a good missionary. Well, it's still in print today. Yeah. Is that useful? Okay, uh, 99, John Tibetanus came out with his uh, most correct book. There's some very, very good things in here. This was a precursor to uh, the Amalekites, Amalekites issue that uh, a Royal has helped us understand. There were no Amalekites, there were Amalekites, and a very, very important, significant uh, shift there. And then we come out in 99 um, with uh, the Chiasmus Bibliography. You've published a lot of bibliographies in your time. Right, and I think they're important. Like I said at the beginning, until you have done your homework, uh, you really can't move forward very uh, effectively. But uh, this was in 1999, everything we could find in any context, biblical, Renaissance literature, you name it, anywhere that anyone ever used or talked about Chiasmus. This has been kept up to date, and it's now on a website, the up-to-date uh, bibliography with live links, so you can click on any item, and if that article is out there on the web somewhere, uh, it's there, so. Year 2000, uh, John Sorensen came out with a piece intended for, for uh, a mass distribution, small piece, called it Mormon's Map. That was his last, uh, uh, really, uh, foray in geography before 2013 with his uh, latest uh, book. 2001, Royal Skousen's wonderful critical text begins to appear. You heard all about that. All about that. Phenomenal. 2002, did we ever think we'd have Oxford University Press publishing about the Book of Mormon? Nope. Here it shows up, 2002. Terrell Gibbons was not on very many people's radar screens back in that. He's, of course, a staple in the Mormon Studies uh, era today, but we were all impressed that Oxford was now publishing for our book. 2002, we've got Echoes and Evidences. This is one of the best of, of the uh, of sort of compilations. Yeah. Elder Maxwell once suggested, so what are the, the, the real hits of the Book of Mormon? And we said, well, there are more than 100 of them. And he said, well, why don't we put together a book? That, and, and then he kind of left it. And we didn't think anything about it for a while. But then we started gathering what we thought were the, the strongest points that we might want to mention from a historical, archaeolog archaeological, linguistic point of view, and so on. For a long time, we called this book Joseph Smith's 100 great Greatest Hits. <laughs> we lost our nerve, and <laughs> here you have uh, it. But if you want to just read one book from Farms uh, that represents the scholarship of the, of the uh, 80s and 90s, this is a very good one to pick. 2003, we have Grant Hardy that comes out with uh, the Book of Mormon a Reader's Edition, published by uh, University of Illinois. And then in 2003, this organization, the Book of Mormon Archaeological Foundation, was uh, founded, and they've been uh, holding a conference ever since. 2003, Diane Worth, who's here in the audience today, published this Parallels, Mesoamerican Ancient to Mid uh, Middle Eastern Traditions. She was a student of Linda Sheely, as was Alan Christensen, who's our Popol Vuh expert, a Kiche Maya expert in the church. And um, what a, a tremendous uh, pipeline that's been from UT Austin right into the, the, the Book of Mormon uh, circles. 2004, we had Doubleday, who published a trade edition of the Book of Mormon. We never thought that had happened. With a different introduction. Then, yeah, yeah on this one, uh, Lehi's, uh, Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem, it dawned on us that as we went looking for a good book that was written by Jewish or Catholic or Protestant scholars about what was the world of Jerusalem like in the decade before the Babylonian conquest. Uh, what's happening there 
Jeremiah from 609 to uh, 587 BC. What's going on politically, religiously? There was no such book. So we uh, said, well, let's pull together a group and see what we can do with that. David and Joanne Seeley worked on this with me, and I think it's, it's written in such a way that it's not exclusively Book of Mormon. Uh, I think anyone interested in that decade, and you know, I think Jewish scholars haven't written very much about that because it's awfully embarrassing hmm. to talk about the loss of the holy city. Uh, but uh, I think it makes a nice contribution and sets the stage for all of what's coming in the Book of Mormon. We then had, in the 2004-2005 time frame, uh, John Clark made some noise uh, with uh, the Book of Mormon archaeology. We then, uh, this uh, ended up being uh, presented at a fair. He also gave a forum address of BYU on the topic. And this was part of uh, his presentation at the, Smiths, uh, the, the Library of Congress, Bicentennial of the, of the birth of Jesus Christ. Or, I'm sorry, Joseph Smith, what am I saying? Uh, Joseph Smith's Bicentennial, 2005. Yeah, some of you may remember that bicentennial, and uh, we had John speak there. He showed, first of all, this slide. Anything that's red was uh, unconfirmed in uh, 1842. You couldn't have found that, but uh, now in 2005, the number of claims about uh, and what we knew about Mesoamerican archaeology and history, uh, we just know a lot more today than we did then. Still a few more that haven't been confirmed, but you can see the trajectory, and that was his point. If we needed proof that Mormonism has hit the mainstream, this is it, <clears throat> Mormonism for dummies. <clears throat> I think what I like the best of the cartoon, these are some people who did not make it across the ocean with the Lamanites, Mulekites. These are not part of your seven groups there, uh, Diane. <laughs> the Impolites, they pushed and shoved their way to the New World. The Parasites, uh, they bummed a ride with their in-laws to the New World. Um, the, uh, oh, the appetites, oh yeah, they, they, they uh, in, enjoyed feasting all the way across. Uh, anyway, you get the point. But there's, there's an important point here. This was the first publication by Jana Reese, who is one of the really leading uh, uh, LDS scholars uh, this day and age. She was, I think still is, the religion editor at Publishers Weekly. And she came out that very same year, with 2005. Trained at Princeton with the Book of Mormon selection annotated and explained. So, Mark, you were saying in your uh, uh, thing today that we needed some kind of a little introduction to the Book of Mormon for, the, for the, the non LDS community. Well, this is largely it. This was her attempt at doing that. It's selection from the Book of Mormon from her uh, perspective as a trained uh, uh, a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Okay, 2006 was when Garth came out with uh, his uh, map, which I recommend to everyone. I believe current research is showing this to be uh, the most accurate map uh, published to date in, the, in the, the, the Book of Mormon. 2006 was also when uh, uh, Jack uh, pulled together all these papers that were published in the Library of Congress for the World of the Joseph, uh, the, uh, World of Joseph Smith Conference. Yeah. And, and with this, Joseph Smith really entered the national consciousness. Uh, back there at the Library of Congress, uh, I worked with a number of the uh, people in the manuscript uh, division, and they were asking questions, well, so, Joseph Smith, here we're putting out this pamphlet that he published when he was running to be President of the United States. And they said, well, I had no idea he ran for President. I said, well, yes, in fact, he was also murdered when he was running for President. I said, can you think of anyone else who's been assassinated while he was a candidate for, for President of the United States? Of course, they all knew Robert Kennedy, but Joseph Smith had no idea. Anyway. Uh, I think it was, uh, again, another landmark of, of uh, people becoming aware of the, uh, the great contribution that Joseph Smith made to religion. And there were five worlds of Joseph Smith that we discussed. The world of the, the, world of the past was one of those five. 2007, Brant Gardner came out with his uh, multi-volume uh, commentary on Book of Mormon from Mesoamerican Perspective. And John Sorensen thinks so highly of this particular book that you, you go to his Mormon Codex today, and he, he says, I have consciously avoided making some of the same points that Brant Gardner has read. I recommend you read his book, for sure. Uh, within 2007, uh, John Lund, who's in the back of the room, came out with this uh, nice little piece, Mesoamerican in the Book of Mormon, is this the place? And uh, uh, the answer, uh, by the way, John, is yes. <laughs> uh, Alan Christensen. 
uh, came out with the uh, Popol Vuh. This is the University of uh, Oklahoma dish of the Popol Vuh. And he's a, on the faculty at the Y, and the world's expert on the, the Quiche Maya uh, uh, book, uh, the, the most important of the, the surviving uh, uh, pre-Columbian Mayan texts. BYU put out the electronic edition, which I use on a regular basis. 2008, Penguin Classics published the Book of Mormon. Carol Gibbons thought that was a pretty important milestone. 2008, uh, Jack published his legal case in the Book of Mormon. If you haven't read this book, you've got to read this book. This is one book that has gone largely ignored in, in the LDS uh, uh, circles, but this will change your perspective. There's a lot of legalism taking place in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, just a lot of trials when you think of uh, the trial of Abinadi, the trial of Korahor, the trial of Nahor, the trial of Alma and Amulek and Ammonihah. Uh, it, this, I worked on this book for 30 years. Maybe that's why it's been slow in catching on, but uh, uh, let me just say that when we put farms together, the purpose was to look at the Book of Mormon from as many angles as possible, and looking at it through a legal lens was one of those. You will never read the phrase, judge righteously in the Book of Mormon the same way again until you've read this book. <clears throat> 2008, Oxford got back in the game again with two very small books, one by uh, Richard Bushman, one by Terrell Gibbons, but nonetheless, we're appearing in, at Oxford University Press. And then 2009, Yale University Press, Royal Scouts and Magnum Opus. The reason I put on both uh, uh, versions up there is because of a cute little thing that Royal just kind of chuckles when he tells you about it. The very first uh, edition actually said Royal Scouts wrote the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and he made sure they got that corrected on the second edition. It says, edited by, yes. Okay, 2010. I, I would have trusted him to do that. <laughs> 2010, Grant Hardy uh, comes out with his Understanding of the Book of Mormon, again published by Oxford University Press. We're hitting the big time here. And who would have guessed? Never in a million years would we have guessed that the uh, Broadway Tony Award would go to a profanity-laced Book of Mormon. <laughs> they, they say in Hollywood that all press is good press, right? And that's the way the brethren looked at it, and I think that's the way it's proven true. Okay, 2011, we began to uh, 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 blog at uh, the Book of Mormon Resources. And this is the most sophisticated attempt uh, to date that has been going on after the last three years. Uh, let me say that the Harold B. Lee Library thinks that what is going on out there on the web is so important for the future of Mormon scholarship that they've hired a full-time librarian just to keep track of all of that and to archive it electronically because 10, 20 years from now, people are going to wonder what was going on out there in the wide, wide world of the web. Yeah. 2011, uh, we have an experiment on the word, reading Alma 32, one of the Salt Press uh, books. 2012, uh, uh, the first comprehensive Book of Mormon model on Google Earth appeared. Terrific resource, downloaded uh, right there on the, on the Book of Mormon Resources website. Updated about every, a few, every few months with the latest uh, stuff. 2012, we have uh, Interpreter, founded by uh, Dan Peterson and uh, Bill Hamlin. And that's a significant uh, organ this day and age. Very, very avant-garde in it, its uh, use of technology. 2012, this significant book appeared. And uh, Jack made sure some Book of Mormon got in there. I did. This was uh, produced by Brandon Plew in the geography department at BYU, Mapping Mormonism beautifully laid out with the latest technology for cartography, uh, having won now several very prestigious uh, awards for Including cartography. Including the Mormon History Association Book of, the, Book of the Year Award. That's right, but uh, big national awards as well. So any of you that want to do a little bit of Book of Mormon geography, there's your model. Go here and see how they've done it in this particular book and then uh, learn and, and uh, follow suit because this is a, a, a good approach. Uh, this is a book that, that has been alluded to um, earlier, well no, this, this we haven't talked about yet, The uh, Incomparable Scripture by Andrew uh, Skinner. Now this was another one of the uh, models of taking a topic and getting uh, 15 people to work on that. Uh, Third Nephi, if you haven't seen this, I, I think it's one of the best books on the Book of Mormon because after all, Third Nephi is what it's all about. It's all leading up to what happens in Third Nephi. And uh, so, and, and let me say, as we're here almost to the end, this will just be my final comment, I think. We have worked hard on the Book of Mormon. We have done a lot. 
and it has not been in vain. It has made a huge difference, and it will continue to make a huge difference in the lives of many, many people. And we have only mentioned a fraction of all of the things that we could have. Kirk picked most of these. I added a few. But all of you probably could have come up here and given a similar kind of run through the things that have meant the most to you. We are so blessed with an outpouring of things to know about the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a book that deserves respect. It's interesting, yes. It's also respectable. And it is unfathomable how many things can be done with it. A simple book can be dismissed easily. This book is complex. It is consistent. It is true. And truth reflects so many different dimensions of reality and life that it will, I think, as I've many, said on many occasions, it's going to wear us all out a long time before we ever wear it out. You said on, on numerous occasions, it <laughs> rewards close reading. <clears throat> OK, this is um, the uh, uh, Joe Spencer book that we heard uh, alluded to earlier today. And uh, it's only been out for a year already significant uh, impact in the scholarly world. And this is the book that I've seen many of you uh, purchasing out there at the Fair Bookstore uh, today. John Sorensen, <laughs> Mormon's Codex. This man is now 89 years old. He, for, for almost uh, um, two and a half decades, has walked from his home in Provo to BYU, a number of blocks, specifically so he would have two the months. help to be able to continue well on into his eight, uh, 80s. And God bless him because he's now 89 and it, this came out uh, at his 89th birthday. And uh, uh, thanks to, to Robert Starlin who put together the uh, video uh, when we gave John Sorensen the Father Lehigh Award in 2009, I was able to present that to Helen and, and uh, John and they were thrilled uh, with uh, your work. Uh, this is where uh, Book of Mormon geographic analysis is headed right now, intense empiricism extraordinarily data-driven. This is an Excel spreadsheet. This shows every occurrence of the word down in a topographical context in the Book of Mormon with the correlation currently shown on Book of Mormon Resources uh, blog and showing you uh, in that red line down at the right-hand side of an Excel spreadsheet that it is, in fact, down in elevation and that we can depend on the ups and the downs in this particular text. Expect more of this kind of thing in the future because uh, if, if we're going to get serious about uh, uh, find out where the Book of Mormon took place, we have to, to, to do a close reading, and then we have to submit it to uh, a significant data analysis of, of this type. Plus, I thought we need the bean counters of the world to get uh, in here somewhere, have, have a little something to do, to do to play around with in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, that counts, too. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That's great.